Hey gang, as you can see, I'm not here today, but I can still teach you. Isn't that awesome? Anyway, based on yesterday's conversation, we talked about trade and, and we talked about towns. And really, we talked to, uh, focused on the towns in the United States. And we said, well, what do these have in common? And we said that they were all on uh, major waterways. Well, if that's the case, and we can look at this map of Europe here, we could guess that in these red spots, where you, you would imagine that these would be some major places for trade. You wouldn't necessarily have them right out here along the Atlantic Ocean because of the, the waves and the currents. And you, can't, you don't see ships just kind of cruising right up on the beach. But when you find harbors, you find places for trade. And these were some of the big places for trade and where some of the big towns sprung up in Europe. So if you're looking in your notes in the Chapter 26 review, there's a spot that says, what were the major trading centers during this time? Well, we have Venice and Flanders. If we flip back to this map, Venice was right here and Flanders right here. We're going to focus a little bit on Flanders and the trade with England. In Flanders, a trade developed with wool and the weaving industry. In England, there are lots of sheep, and with sheep comes the wool. So they would trade this wool with Flanders. Flanders would then create cloth out of it and then ship it all throughout Europe. So this was the first real international trading industry between Flanders and England, and it was wool and cloth. And if you follow the yellow lines here, this is where this cloth would head to. It would all head down into the Mediterranean, to Venice, to Constantinople, and up to the Black Sea, and then out into Russia and China. Here's a close-up of the Flanders area that you see here in green. England would have been just over here off the map, but where there's trade, there's money. So there will be, over the years, a lot of fighting over Flanders. You've got France down here, Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands, and England, and it will often be fought over. Today, it is in what is considered Belgium. This is another look at some of the trade routes and the towns that popped up during this time period. So you can see from Flanders here where this trade took off and went to. Pretty cool. On this map here, you can actually see what was traded. So from the north, you've got fish and pitch and timber, coal down here, ivory from the tusks of the uh, sea lions, and uh, you've got carpets and dried fruit and spices and glassware over here and ceramics and carpets. Now, I want you to, um, I'd like you to pause right here. So if you're at home and watching this, pause. If you are a substitute teacher, if you could pause right here. And I'd like the students to read this and fill in the spots in their notes for what is a merchant and what is a fair. A good analogy I like to use here is if you can picture a flea market, like Rice's Flea Market. If you've ever gone to Rice's and you look at the cars that people drive to those things and they have like vans and stuff with all their stuff in it, that's got to get tiresome carrying that stuff around from place to place to place. Um, so what they would eventually do is they got tired of moving around. So they would find good spots and they would stop and they would find a place where they could build a, a, a house where they could store their stuff that they sell, their goods, their wares. You get it? Find a house where they can store their wares. A warehouse. They would live right there as well. They would make their things and sell their things in that spot. And then more people would move into that area. And this is one way that towns began. You can see that word bonk, which means bench, at which the money changers sat. And this comes from the English word bank. So you would have bankers eventually in these areas that became these towns. So these towns sprang up along trade routes, but also near castles. If you had a town around a castle, this helped protect against robbers and fights between nobles. We talked about these burgs before. We talked about Pittsburgh and what, you know, this burg meant like a fortified town. Um, burgs were often near castles. Pittsburgh, East Stroudsburg, Harrisburg, that stuff all, we can, we can see that stuff today in our country. Okay, now take a second. Again, let's pause. Let the students go ahead and try to find the definition and a few keywords for commune and charter in this reading here. 
Okay, so you should have gotten this for a commune, a political group to work against nobles in establishing self-government commune from, you can see the word community come from this word. And let's drag it all the way down here. And for charter, a document that allows townspeople to govern themselves and run their own affairs. They would go to the king with this written document and say, hey, listen, we'll pay you taxes if you let us run our own town. We will appoint a mayor. We will take care of the law. We will have houses for the poor. They take care of everything. They just pay the king taxes. So the king is like, wait, so I'm still going to get money, but I just kind of let you guys run things? It sounds like a pretty good deal. So that's how. That's another way that towns got started. Now we talk about the Magna Carta. I'm going to provide a link for the Magna Carta after this. Uh, the Magna Carta means the Great Charter. The Great Charter, this was signed by King John in England. The nobles forced King John to sign this. This gave power from the king to the nobles. The king was majorly pressured into this. Really didn't plan on following through with it. But it still serves as a precursor to, say, like our um, Constitution, our Declaration of Independence. So pretty monumental at the time. Here's what a charter may have looked like. It's not just one page. We usually would have had much more with this. But this would have been a document given to the townspeople, allowing them to run their own affairs. Now, within a town, we had what were called guilds. If you turn the page in your notes, and we click pause here, go ahead and read about guilds for a minute, and then we'll get to apprentice, journeyman, and master. Okay, take a look. What is a guild? It's a business group, a union. Okay, again, we'll talk about this apprentice, journeyman, master in a second. And what did this union do? Well, they protected their members. How did they protect their members? Well, if you had two shoemakers in a town and a third person came in and said, I'm going to make shoes here, they would have said, no, you can't do that. We have enough shoemakers here. They tell... They regulate the prices and the products. They say, you must make shoes that are of this quality, and you must charge this amount of money, and you can only have two workers. You cannot compete against each other. Now, neither one's ever going to get really rich, but they're going to be stable. They're going to have a job. This really doesn't fit in our society today. In some places it does, but you wouldn't see four gas stations on the corners and an intersection like you do, or a McDonald's pop up across the street from a Burger King. That's called competition. They didn't have competition back then. They had this regulation that allowed everyone to live okay. Now, other things that they did. They paid for funerals if someone should die within the guild, and they helped the families of those people who belonged to the guild should someone get sick or die. Okay, now here's that job trading. It wasn't easy to become a, a guild member. To begin, a person had to be an apprentice or trainee. There's a good word to write down there, trainee, in a trade for two to seven years. This is where you were taught a trade by your master or by the expert. You lived with him, you obeyed him until your, until your training was finished. You did not get paid. That is worth writing down for an apprentice. They took care of you. They fed you, but you were not paid. You did the odd jobs. Your, your job was to watch and learn. After many years, two to seven usually, you could become a journeyman. This was a person who worked under a master, but you were now paid. After a certain amount of time, you took a test to become a master. How do you take a test, say as a carpenter? You create whatever it is that you build, and if it's good enough or passes the test, then you can become a master. What is that thing you create called? It is called a master piece. This proves that you have learned your craft. Once you've passed this test, then you've become a master craftsman. Now, by the 1400s, Merchants and artisans had begun challenging these guilds. They felt the guilds kept them from increasing their trade and profits. So they're saying, well, wait, this is holding me back. You think about it today, we have unions. For instance, there's a teacher's union. 
and the teachers union bargains for us and it also defends us so that like say Mr. Hollihan couldn't walk in the door and say you're fired because I don't like you that couldn't happen the union would get my back now if I did something stupid then the union wouldn't have my back like let's say I cursed every other word in the classroom well that wouldn't be too smart and the union would say well you're stupid and we can't really defend you on this but it also says that I can only earn so much money and I can I can go up to a certain level and then I stop all right and it means that if I'm a very good teacher I make that amount of money and for someone else who's working the same amount of years and maybe they're not a very good teacher they make the same amount of money so I could be someone that says hey this stinks I want more money I don't like this union stuff. So you can see that's what they did back here. They felt that these guilds held them back. So in some cases, that could be true. Here's an image here. You see you have got the master and the journeyman working together to create these cabinets. Here you see the different guilds just within the cloth industry. Okay, now we're going to take just a few minutes and compare life in a village versus life in a town or a city. Here you can see a village after the need for castles kind of sort of went away a little bit. There wasn't that need for defense. You see you've got the manor house here, the church, the peasants lived here in this little uh, village, and then you've got the mill, and then you've got the meadow. You take a look, this is another image, and you can see, so John Smith has this red land, Peter Potter. You can tell by their last names what their job was. Peter Potter has less land, so he was less important. The Lord, who lived in the manor house, had the most land, so he was the most important. The key thing to remember here in the village is it's kind of spread out. It's probably a little relaxed. It's rural. Not bad. Food is quite fresh right out of the farm. Now let's go take a look at the towns. Within the town, usually people, whoever did whatever they did, they worked near each other. So you would have had all the butchers on Butcher's Row, the weavers on Weaver's Row, the fish, the people worked in, in seafood on Fish Street. Most people couldn't read, so they had signs outside of their doors. If you had this sign outside of your door, that may have meant that you were a tailor or worked in clothing, or you worked as a cobbler working on shoes, or as a pawnbroker. You take a look. This is a an image of what a town may have looked like. First of all, the buildings are made of wood and they're very closely packed together. That's a major fire risk. You see the trash thrown right into the street and the pigs were left to roam about to eat the trash. You would have had rats with the trash, especially because you had an open sewer right in the middle of the street. Because if you lived up in this house up top here and you went to the bathroom in your bucket, you generally just dumped it out of the top window, so you better watch where you're walking. So take a minute and let's compare these two. You've got the village or the town. What do you think was better for eating and drinking? Some people say the village is better. It's got fresh food. The water's probably cleaner. Some people might say the town is better. Think about it now. Where would you go out for a nice dinner? Sure, there's plenty of restaurants around here, but the known restaurants are in the city. So you've got more variety there. How about for opportunities for work? Well, there's definitely more opportunities for work in the towns or the cities. However, for getting things done, it's probably easier to focus with less going on in the village. However, you better make sure you have all your materials because then you have to go to the town to get them. Now, for getting sick or getting ill, it definitely um, was better to live in the village. There was less sickness and illness there than there were in the towns because people were so closely packed together and the conditions were very, very dirty. Now, this leads us to our next topic. What happens when you have unsanitary conditions? We'll talk about that when we get back on Monday. Check out the few links after this. And have a good weekend.